Welcome to my thoughts on the first season of Tales of the Jedi, the Star Wars show. In case the title wasn't enough of a clue. So, spoilers for everything Star Wars leading up to and including the season. And, yeah, um, I like each episode of this season fine. So, uh, yeah. Um, this video will be my riffs analysis for the season, not a review. I will do a spoiler-free review once I've watched all seasons. And, yeah, so, before I get into the episodes themselves, basically it seems, you know, this season at least, I don't know about the future ones, it's just Disney trying to increase interest in Star Wars stuff that they already own. It's aimed at the people who are not going to read the Ahsoka book that I'm aware of, there's at least one. Um, let's see, I'm not 100% certain what the source is, but as far as I understand, there already was backstory for Dooku before this season. You know, it hasn't been animated, so I haven't seen it. It's it's not animated or live action, so I haven't seen it. Um, I, yeah, I did do a brief Google search. There appear to be some Google, uh, Dooku books. Uh, let's see, and... Um, yeah, like, it's... You know, haven't read them, but it seems like this season contradicts the at, at least the Dooku stuff, maybe also the Ahsoka stuff. You know, basically Disney hopes that you watch this and then go watch the Clone Wars and the sequel trilogy. This more so than the idea that this is really incredible, worthwhile stories to tell, which, you know, for example, I felt that Visions were, you know, really compelling stories. <sighs> yeah, you know, Bad Batch I, I like a lot about. You know, but but yeah, this and Resistance just feel like they just want people to keep watching, even if they don't have that much that's super interesting. So, let's dive into episode one, Life and Death. Let's see. So, yeah, the episode opens on a guy who's apparently really, really happy that there's a crying baby, seems like an odd reaction, but you do you. I'm glad the episode doesn't play coy. We all know this is going to be Ahsoka. One person in this episode is going to be Ahsoka related to her, or at least have a relationship with Ahsoka. So I appreciate that they immediately tell us that baby is Ahsoka. No offense. Why do people always say that when causing offense? It's not a magic spell, dude. As always, really appreciate the pro-nature message in a piece of Star Wars media. It's been there from the beginning, but it's not always front and center. You must face death, not fear it, which is a good message. Let's see. And Ahsoka's mother is in danger from a saber tooth tiger. I appreciate this episode has a somewhat lax pace, like Visions. I hope to see more of that in Star Wars in the future. Not everything needs to be fast paced. Uh, you know, the movies are. If if you want fast paced Star Wars, you can just watch the movies. When Ahsoka is taken, her mother goes through the three stages of reacting to learning that Ahsoka Tano is in a Star Wars thing. This is the same for most viewers. No! Crying and reluctant acceptance. You know, eventually she gets a lot more tolerable. And that brings us to episode two. Justice. So this one switches, you know, this it goes from Ahsoka to... Dooku, and I mean, I guess maybe they're doing, like, chronological order. It kind of reminded me of how the first Sin City movie starts with, you know, the, the first chunk of one story and then, re you know, returns to that later after doing at least one other story, but, yeah. Props for making Dooku and Qui-Gon really resemble young Christopher Lee and younger Liam Neeson in both appearance and voice. R.I.P. Christopher Lee, you were a legend. Allow me to make my intentions clear. I am going to play Dracula and so many other evil characters so well an entire generation will think of me when they think of Dracula. And the senator treats his people really badly so they become desperate and kidnap his son. The real-life present-day America equivalent are riots in response to cops getting away with murdering African Americans. Though that isn't violence against people, it's, you know, breaking stuff and... Then you have conservatives coming out of the woodwork to say that breaking stuff is worse than killing people, which I'm not gonna go on a rant. Not gonna go on a rant. 
and see. And yeah, the senator's son actually empathizes with the villagers, and he's like, I wish, you know, I should get kidnapped more often. The senator shows up to the village, missing one son, please release him. And the negotiations break down, and then there was a firefight. And Dooku breaks out the force choke. Qui-Gon stops it by freeing the senator's son. Am I morbid in that I think it would have been a little funny if it actually just kept going? If the senator was like, nope, not good enough. And kept, like, yeah. And Dooku points out it's not guaranteed that things will change. Which is, you know, it both explains why he is... You know, why he continues down this path, and it is also just, you know, there is some truth to that. It's necessary to, you know, it's not enough to start things going in the right direction. Episode 3, Choices. Dooku wants to investigate, Windu does not. The mystery is solved pretty quickly. It wasn't bad for how long it lasted. And the Jedi claim peace, but they support the rich and powerful. This is true of the police in many Western countries today, so very relevant issue to bring up. Don't trust the authorities just because they carry a badge. Dooku becomes radicalized, which hopefully communicates that that's too far an extreme to go in response to that. I mean, the, the obvious the problem here is that it also kind of implies... Disney does this with the MCU as well. The villain will make really good points, but then it kind of sends the message that, you know, they're just as bad. You know, if, if you want police reform, you're just as bad, at, you're, you end up becoming a fascist. You know, it just does, because, like, in the movies, he is eagerly fascist. Like, the, the he only stops being into it when he realizes that Sidious, you know, kills him. Oh, hey, Penis Head finally covered up that thing. I guess a funeral is what it takes. Which, fair enough, penises do not observe a traditional mourning period. And that brings us to episode four, The Sith Lord. We see Dooku erase Kamino, something that, you know... Yeah, it's it's not really a surprise that it was him. You know, it, it shows that that's how far he's going now. You know, he's controlling the narrative. Let's see. Yaddle. I vaguely remember the... I guess this episode is supposed to explain why Yaddle is in Phantom Menace, but not Attack of the Clones or Revenge of the Sith. So yeah, the episode starts part way through the Phantom Menace. We see what happened with Dooku after the Phantom Menace as well, but before Attack of the Clones. Since there's like, what, ten years between the two? And the council is leaving for the funeral on Nebu Hoo Hoo. Dooku argues with Sidious. He thinks that it was going too far. And Sidious is like, no, this is not going too far enough. And Dooku has to choose between Sidious and the Jedi through how he deals with Yaddle. And Yaddle actually survives the massive cog. And Dooku kills Yaddle afterwards, choosing the dark side. Reasonably compelling to watch. And that brings us to episode 5, Practice Makes Perfect. So yeah, we're back with Ahsoka. I appreciate the member berries of bringing the voice actors. I want to say Anakin is played by Matt L Lan Lanter. And you have... I, th I think that is also the same Obi-Wan actor. You know, although they barely have any... Uh, what's the word? They don't have a lot of banter in this one. Matt Lanter and his banter. And there's not that much, like, Anakin and Ahsoka. You know, they, they play off each other at least a little bit. But, yeah, it kind of, you know, 
member berries and filler. Obviously, I understand the the episode is supposed to explain how Ahsoka survived Order 66 when so many Jedi that had been Jedi for decades longer, some so capable they served on the Council, did not. You know, keep, keeping in mind, you know, penis head dies, um, mask face dies, you know, Jedi that were on the Jedi Council in Phantom Menace, you know, 20 years later, die. Ahsoka, you know, so young that, I mean, I guess she was maybe a child during Attack of the Clones, but, you know, just, yeah. Uh, let's see, you know, the answer to that question is a combination of plot armor, which in Star Wars is the single most powerful thing, like, forget the Death Star, forget the Force, plot armor is where it's at, and prequel era Jedi, especially animated ones, being ridiculously OP, and most of the prequel Jedi that we know died, died in the live action films. I don't think it's a great idea to draw attention to the fact that Ahsoka lived when so many others didn't. It's like with Rogue One, you don't need to spend so much time explaining it away. Some viewers will go with it, others will not. I don't think this kind of story is as beneficial as simply pretending that it makes more sense than it does. You know, it's the, these stories are not supposed to be 100% realistic. You know, the, the a new hope is made. You know, uses a number of like tropes and and outright like fairy tales. You know, let's see. So yes, that brings us to the finale, episode six, resolve. So yeah, Ahsoka Tano reveals her powers in order to rescue someone from an industrial accident, which tells me that her family will get bow and arrow to death later. And I, I do appreciate, you know, they talk about we can't, you know, nobody can keep up with the farming quotas, you know, like how the Soviet Union bled Ukraine dry. And, yeah, the brother knows that she's a Jedi and even reveals it to her, which is an which is a choice, certainly. And let's see. I guess he feels so confident that she'll be caught, he'll be rewarded. Maybe they'll ease off on the quotas or something. Yeah. And yeah, an Inquisitor goes there. And, yeah, the, the brother says, I thought I would be rewarded, but, you know, not realizing fascists see you only as a tool, not an individual. And I appreciate that Ahsoka does rescue the brother, the, you know, despite the, you know, the betrayal and everything. And, yeah, so the episode, this episode basically reveals how Ahsoka became fulcrum. And I will acknowledge, like, you know, we didn't know that from watching, like, I don't think Rebels answered it, it just revealed that it was the case, and I'm pretty sure where the last we saw Clone Wars also didn't, like, we, we could tell that, you know, she wants to help people, but it's not, yeah, it, it doesn't go to, so, yeah, you know, I... I get why some might have felt it was a story worth telling, maybe even that needed telling. Yeah. Um, I do, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say about this season. Um, I really hope, you know, I'm, I know I'm not the only person who feels that this was a little bit of a letdown, so I hope that they you know, yeah, improve for season two. Uh, you know, I, I definitely do think that this could be something. I, I hope they don't feel the need to lock themselves into, oh, it has to be chronological, you know, the the way that, you know, I, I think Assassin's Creed, you know, that, that series made a very wise choice when they started jumping back and forth in time instead of going completely linear chronologically. Yeah. Um, that's... Dude, that's all I got. May the Force be with you.